So this session is being recorded. Thank you everyone uh, so much for joining us today for the Lunch and Learn. Today we have Nick Sinclair joining us and he's going to talk to us about, oh, next sheet, talent retention strategies post-pandemic. Now I would like to let you know that Nick Sinclair is from a company called The Outsourced Accountants or TOA Global. The leader in global outsourcing for accounting firms. The Outsourced Accountant is the most professional accounting outsourcing partner to help accounting and CPA firms build and grow an offshore team. So thank you so much, Nick, for joining us today. Um, we do have, I can just see that we've got a few more people just joining us as that's happening. Um, but I'd like to hand over to you to talk to us about this, this topic. And if people do have questions, please jump into the um, chat area um, and, and we'll have a, a, an opportunity for Q&A towards the end. But thank you, Nick. Thanks, Heather. Thanks for the opportunity to chat to everyone today and, and hello. I'm going to be talking about one of them, probably the thing that I'm most passionate about, which is people. And I talk a lot about how do firms and businesses attract, manage and retain. And today specifically, we're going to talk about that retention piece. Now, Heather mentioned we are a global outsourcing business. We've also got a, a training business, so a learning business, which we're an accredited RTO. We've only just recently got that. So we do cover the full spectrum um, of the people strategy. And that's really what I want to talk about is retention strategies. And I'm going to start off by talking about a survey that we've recently done to over a thousand team members um, and the results that we got from that and to see whether or not it surprises anyone, the results. A few of these did surprise me, but a few of them didn't. So the survey we did was all around people's experience with work, what makes them stay at an employer. And then we had a whole bunch of other surveys we did around our brand and et cetera with it. from an employment point of view. The number one thing, which surprised me a little bit because it's always talked about it not being the most important, the number one that was statistically blew everything else away of why people stay in their jobs was salary. Now that may or may not surprise you, but for me, there's often the purpose, everyone talks about purpose and they talk about all these other benefits, but the number one reason, which was the clear winner, was people stay in a role for salary. So when we talk about salary, I link this back to what is your performance review process and salary review process? Because when I talk to a lot of accountants in the marketplace about this, the often comment is, is I don't get a yearly release. My output may have increased, but businesses, accounting and bookkeeping businesses aren't paying me more because I'm doing more. So one of the things that we talk about retention is you need to ensure that your team members are competitively paid. Now, I always talk about competitively paid, and this can Above market. Now, when I ask that question, most businesses say, yep, I definitely would. If, it, if I got someone that was an absolute rock star, I would pay them well. But I always secondly back that on to say, review your current team and are you paying them market rate, below market rate or above market rate? Now, as a, I owned an accounting and financial planning business for over 12 years and, and I reflect back and I often think, well, we paid what the market paid always talked about us paying above, et cetera, but a lot of the time we didn't. And when I relate this to sport, professional sporting teams pay the best money for the best players. But how many of us treat our business like that? So what is your process? Are you actually going through an annual performance review process and a salary review process that's separate to that? Your conversations around performance should be regular. They should be frequent. They should be two-way feedback, not just one. But it shouldn't be the only time you do it is when you discuss salary reviews. So within TOA globally, and we, we're across five countries, we've got over 2,000 staff now, we do a quarterly conversation around performance. We also have this on our one-on-ones weekly with all of our team members. The managers will have frequent conversations around how the team member's going. We then have a mid-year proper performance review process, which is a list of questions and, and then a yearly salary review, which is very different to that. So we do June and December, salary is in December, performance is in June, and then we have uh, 
almost weekly performance conversations. So my question is, is given that salary is the number one, what are you doing to ensure that you're paying your team members the best? Now, I finished a read. Um, Netflix, the owner of Netflix, wrote a book. Um, amazing. A lot of his, uh, the way that they do things is very different. I don't think many within this industry. I certainly wouldn't imply most of them. There's no budgets. There's team members can spend what they want. But the thing that I took away with it was they put it to their team members we want you to bring us the salary data. We want you to be getting these recruiter calls and telling us what you're worth. We want you to have that feedback with us because we want to make sure that we're always paying you above market rate. Now, I think that that's a little bit extreme, but the question is, when did you last review your team members and go, if I lost them, what would I have to pay to replace them? And if you're paying them under what you would have to get to get someone else in there, I'd, I'd seriously look at, how do you increase it so that the salary is not even something that's on their mind? How do you make sure that you're paying them really well? Now, from a business point of view, we need to make sure we're getting the output, but that's a very different conversation. The second number, well, the number two on the survey that came out was work-life balance. So salary is the most important thing to them. Second is work-life balance. Now, post-pandemic, let's talk about the last 12 months. What sort of work-life balance did your team have? Now, I talk to most accounting firms and I'm in pretty much all of the Facebook groups and I see the conversations around people are burnt out. Haven't had a break. I saw one yesterday. I haven't had a break from since 2018. You know, I want to get rid of my business. I'm over it. There's lots of conversations of that, but let's look about that from your team's perspective. Do you promote that they go home to their family at 5 p.m.? Do you promote that if their children have a cross-country event tomorrow, that they go to that and then they work flexibly around that. Or are you very much around, they have to be logged on at this time, they have to be in the office at this time if you're office base, they need to do the hours, I need to see them, or do you really provide work-life balance? And I think that COVID really showed the ones that do and don't. Now, yes, we as a business and as an industry were busier than I think we've ever been, but I still saw a lot of businesses that still maintained a fairly regular rhythm to what they were pre-COVID. Yes, they were doing a little bit more, but their staff were working reasonable hours and they paid attention to that because that is important to your team members. Yes, it's our businesses. We're happy to do the 80 or 100 hours or whatever hours you want to do. But your team members, they're a team member. They don't own the business. What's their motivation to be doing those hours? The reality is all surveys show that they don't want to. So work-life balance was a big one as number two. Number three was workload, which sort of flows into the work-life balance. Um, they don't want to be overloaded with work. They don't want to be having the pressure and burden, even if they have work-life balance where they can go home at five. They don't want to know that they're two days behind in their workload and that, you know, while I'm not doing the hours, I've got this pile of work that is piling up and it's only getting bigger and bigger. So workload, while it seems like a bit of an odd one for a survey like this, People want to know that the work they're getting is realistic, that they can achieve it within the hours that they're working because that then affects their work-life balance. Even if they, even if you say, well, they're leaving at five or that we're flexible with when they work, if you're giving them too much work to do that's not realistic within the hours that you're saying to them, then you might be promoting work-life balance, but you're not actually living it. And there's a very big difference between promoting it and doing it. So workload is really important around the amount of work that your team have is reasonable for what they can out, put out in the hours that they work and that the hours that they're paid for. So that's an interesting one. The fourth one was around learning. And again, I've seen some chats about this in Facebook groups recently, and we hear a lot about the challenges of finding staff. And I would be surprised if anyone on, you know, listening to this says, oh no, it's easy for me to go and find staff. But the reality is, is one of the biggest challenges I see is we have people with great aptitude and great skills and the great desire to grow, but we don't actually develop them. And, you know, there's that famous saying, I think Richard Branson said it, you know, we can, we can not train the people that we have in the hope that they won't, that they will leave or I think I got that around the wrong way. What happens if we train people and they leave or what happens if you don't train them and they stay? That's a bigger problem. So if we want to really build and grow the best team, then we need to develop our team. 
Now, to develop your team, you need to invest in your team. What does that mean? You need to pay for them to grow as people, not just technicians. And a lot of the training that I see accounting firms and bookkeeping firms do is the technical training. Now, the IPA, the CPA, all of these different industry bodies are great at delivering the technical training, but we need to make our people better people. What does that mean? A lot of that is soft skills. How do they lead a team? If your business is growing and they're going to be a team leader in the future, how do you teach them the leadership skills that they need? A lot of it is around confidence. A lot of it is around self-limiting beliefs. What are you doing to develop them as better people? If you want them communicating with your clients, what are you doing to develop their communication skills? Now, I'll give you a quick snapshot into some of the training we've done. So our executive team recently have just undergone a leadership program, an eight-week course that we paid for all of our team, our leadership team to go through and do that. Now, at the back end of that, in two weeks' time, we start a six-week presentation skills training. Now, our executives have worked in significantly larger companies than we are. They've worked in the top end of all of these businesses. They've done this before, but we want to continually be sharpening their skills, refreshing them and making them better people. So every single one of our 2000 staff have a dedicated training plan that covers compliance, things like the regulatory things we have to go through, Privacy Act, you know, cybersecurity, we do that every year just to refresh them because these things are, as we know, becoming more and more common. We then have the human skills aspect of that framework, which is how do we make them better people from the soft skills point of view? Leadership training, it could be communication training. It could be a range of different soft skills. And then we have the third component of their training plan, which is the technical skills. Where are they today? Where do we want to develop them to so that they can be at that level in the future? And that's a key part because if you don't develop them now, in 12 months time when you need them to be a senior or you need them to be a manager or, or continue to grow and they don't have the skill set, then they're not going to be. The number one role that is the most difficult role to place, and we see this through the job board statistics and we see this through, we recruit on average about 120 to 140 staff every month. The number one request we get from accounting firms globally and bookkeeping firms is a senior accountant or a senior bookkeeper. Now, what that shows to me is that people aren't developing their people. The biggest problem they should have is at the other end. But the biggest challenge that firms and businesses have is they're not developing their people up quick enough or they're leaving. And I'll talk about the leaving part in a minute. So learning is such a critical part. How much are you investing in your staff? All of our clients invest 5% of their team members' wages in their learning and development. It's part of their package. What are you spending currently? I saw some chats yesterday in one of the Facebook church groups, $250 for six staff. And I was like, well, you obviously aren't developing your people. So we look at that's the fourth. Um, the big fifth one is flexibility of workplace. Now we could talk for hours and hours about that. Work from home is part of that. Some people want work from home. And Heather sent out an article last week. I, I read it. I loved it. Um, and it was all around, yes, some people do want to work from home, but some people want to work hybrid. And guess what? Some people love working in the office. I'm one of those people. I absolutely love being in the office. We've got 30 staff on the Gold Coast. All of us have been working in the office. We've attracted people that love being here, working together, communicating. But there are a bunch of our team. We've got one person that lives in Perth. We've got another person that lives in Sydney. There are some people that want to work from home. So what you need is flexibility in the workplace. There is no right or wrong. And everyone will argue that their way is better. You know, it's better to be remote and I can do all this. Well, that's great. But for some people, they do love the environment and it changes for age groups. So what you need is workplace flexibility. What's going to work for your business to serve your clients? Because let's not forget at the end of the day, we are here to serve our clients. And yes, workplace flexibility is great, but you need your team members to be able to answer your client questions during certain work hours. So everyone can't have the flexibility where they work whenever they want, because at the end of the day, we wouldn't have a business. We're here to serve our clients. We're a service-based business. So how do we do that? So you do need that flexibility, work from home for some, hybrid for others, office for some. What's your business want to be? There's no right or wrong. It just limits or, or opens up the talent that you can attract and retain within your business, depending on what that is. Now, the last one that I wanted to throw in here for a topical part before we 
wrap up is people want to know what their future is and they want to know that they're part of something bigger. So this comes back to purpose. And when I look at people's websites, I often refer to the businesses, well, the websites are built for attracting clients. People that want to work for you want to know one thing, what's in it for me. So if I want to come and join your business, what are you going to do for me as a team member that makes me want to work for you? Now, I'm an A player. What's going to attract me to your business? Now, some businesses don't struggle with this. If you look at their brands, their brands are innovative. They're funky. They're cool. It looks like a workplace I want to be part of. I look at other websites and I'm like, I don't know about that. I read the job ads and I'm like, well, that job sounds nothing but boring. And I get even paid worse. And then I have to come to the office and I want to work from home. So you need to be really looking at people want to know what is your business's future? What is your business's bigger vision? What's the purpose? Because if your purpose is for your business, for you to work four days a week and have Fridays off, what does that do for me as one of your team? That's not a purpose. That's your personal purpose, not your business purpose. So you need to build the tools to show this to your team. Now, we use the scaling up methodology, Vern Harnish. Um, it's called Scaling Up. If you haven't read it, it's one of the best business books I read many, many moons ago, probably 20 years ago. And it talks about having a one-page plan. Now, I'll, we've got one-page plans all over our office. They're on every wall. Everyone's got them individually. And it talks about what our purpose is, what our mission is, what our customer focus is, what our big rocks are for this quarter and for the year. And it talks about all the key things that your team members need to know. And then you need to build that into your dialogue. You then need to have a people plan. So you need to know what your business is doing for the next two to three years to grow and develop your people so that you can show your team members to say, look, over the next three years, our aim is to grow our business by 20%. What that means is we're going to need roughly another five people. Your role currently is this, but over the next three years, we see that if you can develop at a level that we need you to, and we're going to invest in you, that you will move into a senior accountant role. And then in the future, this is where the business is going. We see that that you may be able to continue to grow from there. So having a very clear people strategy, which very few firms, they do the financial part, but they forget to go, what people will we need for that? And then once you've got that, you link it back to training plans for every team members to say that in three years, I'm gonna be able to have my team at this level. Now I'll give you an example. Toa has been around for seven and a half years. I've got a full executive team that run the business. Last week was the first time in 20 years of being in business that I actually went away and turned my phone off and didn't turn it on the whole week. Now that's taken me seven years with this business to build a people strategy that I can have them running the business. Our CEO, Craig Mansell has been instrumental in doing that. He's built an amazing team around him, which run the business across five countries. Now every business can do that. But for you to be able to get to that point, you need to build a strategy. This has been a seven and a half year vision for me to get to this. But I got there. I still work in the business enormous amounts, but it means now that I can switch off and I can actually really be present on holidays, not always checking my phone while the kids are running out to ride a horse on a farm stay. And then I'm quickly checking that nothing's going on. Might not be that extreme for you, but a people strategy is so critical to free you up so that you don't live within your business, that you control the business, the business doesn't control you. So that is the seven key points I wanted to cover off today. I know that I've covered a very little on, on a lot of different parts, um, but yeah, I'd love to, love to hear any questions you have. And Thank you um, so much, Nick, for sharing that with us. That was really insightful. And I do encourage um, other um, attendees, if you want to jump in, ask a question, turn your camera on or ask in the panel, um, you're welcome to. Um, and uh, Ken, who I believe is in watching us from, um, I think it was Houston, Texas, or, or uh, Austin, Texas, maybe, um, <laughs> suggested that uh, it's great information. And thank you for, for, for sharing it. And you always do share really um, insightful information. And, and uh, you and Toa actually do a great job of pulling together this and information and, and, and packing and, and, and sharing out to the community. So I would like to ask you in terms of the first thing that you mentioned was, in, um, was regarding and around remuneration and that 
they actually, the survey came out and said that, that people wanted to actually be paid more. Now, some things I have read um, have suggested reviewing um, remuner remuneration, the base and increasing it on a temporary basis. Do you think it's effective to increase it on a temporary basis or do you think it's, it's something due to the pandemic? Or do you think it's something that across the board, you just need to consistently be reviewing the remuneration and, 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 and just being serious about it and, and, and having those constant evolving conversations about it? To be honest, if you want to keep the best people, you need to pay them well. Mm. And we have a very, very low unemployment in this industry, which means that our team members have the choice of where to work. We don't have that luxury of going, we don't care, we'll pay you low and you'll stay. So the reality is we do twice a year full benchmark reviews of the market. Now we do that in a lot more detail because we have obviously a lot of team members, but Hayes and Salary, there's a lot of these um, recruitment companies that come out with these reports once or twice a year. We always basically look at that, look at what we're offering, and we always want to be slightly above market. We mm. want to be that we are above it. So twice a year we do a proper review doesn't take a significant amount of time realistically, particularly in Australia, we get the research reports from the recruiters. Are we on market? Yes or no. If we're not, we increase it. Temporary is, you know, it's saying to a team member, I'm going to give you a little bit of money now just to try and keep you passive or to pacify you. It's not sending a right message. It's basically, we value you. Therefore, we've researched the market. We believe that you're worth more money now because of the output that you're doing. And because of that, we're going to reward you by now giving you X. Yeah. Now yeah, also absolutely. remember that salary is total package. It, it's a, you can add a lot of soft benefits into this. So things like learning is a soft benefit. Things like mentoring and developing them is a soft benefit. You can equate a figure to, but it doesn't physically have to be monetary. Mm. So when you look at total package, it's, it's basically the total offering you're giving your employee to be part of your team. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nick. Now, does anyone else would like to ask a question? I know, Diane, you've come on. Are you interested? In, do you have any questions there to ask, Diane? No, I don't have any, any questions to, to ask. I consider it very, very important because that's our greatest asset is our team that work for us. And we put a lot of focus on, on things in-house that we do for ours. <clears throat> and it is, yeah, money is important, but it's not the only thing. They have to feel good, and we do put a fair bit of investment there. But, yeah, no specific question. I do Thanks. like it, actually, you know, that point of getting them to do the research, though, to find out for their skill set and what they're after, what else is there that's comparable. And recruiters are great at that because they're always ringing them. So the easiest way to do is for them to ring a recruiter and say, look, I'm looking to go to market. What job could you find me and how much would you get me? Um, and recruiters will think that they've then got someone that they can, they then go and sell that person in essence. So it's, a, it's an easy way to actually do it. As long as the, th the key message is though, so if you're promoting that to your team, you need to ensure that your culture is strong and that you're doing enough that when they go and potentially get offered a little bit more, they'll go, you know what? Yes, money is important, but I'm getting all these other things that I'm not going to get the development, et cetera, at other businesses. So... Yeah, what I do sense. find interesting of that, though, is that we're, um, like we have a global team. Where they go and research what the market rate is, where's the benchmark? <laughs> what country is the benchmark? Because what's stopping them from um, comparing that to what you'd pay someone locally? Yeah, but that's the, it's in the region where they operate. That's, that's what they compare it to because that's what their, their local demand is worth. It's not necessarily, you can't compare. I mean, that's like some of our team in Australia have said, well, we want to get paid in USD because our Canadian office, oh, sorry, our US office gets paid in USD. Our Canadian office gets paid in Canadian. But the difference between Canada and, you know, US is an hour or less on a flight. But yet the Canadians get paid in Canadian dollars versus the USD. But the reality is they work in Canada. They live in Canada. Their living costs are in Canada. So it's the same with the Philippines is their living costs are in the Philippines. So there's, you don't need to pay them Australian wages if they're doing Australian work because their living costs are so different. But even if you're comparing um, even the Australians, uh, the, the rate you'd pay someone, say, in South Australia is quite different to someone you pay perhaps in Sydney. It is, but that's where, I mean, from a business point of view, we take what is the highest in the in, in that country and then pay above that. So in the Philippines, for example, we're across four different locations, very different. It's like Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Toowoomba. 
we pay based on the highest one in that country and we pay everyone equally across the country because what's stopping them with remote work now for that example in Perth working for someone in Melbourne because they are if if you pay locally then they're going to get they're obviously going to want to work in for someone remotely from Melbourne because they pay more so that's where we always go what's the national highest and we want to pay that because we want to attract the best now they've got to perform the proviso that I do say on that is if you pay the best they need to perform it's like having a star soccer player or netball player if they're not performing they get sacked and then you bring in the next star so it's you know that sounds a bit harsh but the reality is you need a high performing team they want to work with high performers if they're not high performers you need to get rid of them and that sounds really harsh but the reality is is that if you accept standards that are lower than what the business requires, that will be what everyone else loops to. And I used this with Heather before, like we've had an absolute rock star before. He was a gun, but culturally he was an absolute horror. So we got rid of him. Now as a business, his output was more than anyone else. So we should have kept him, but we knew that the effect that that has on the business. So culturally he had to go. And that lifts the rest of the team because they know, all right, I'm here with high performers. We have a winning culture. It's a team approach. It's not an individual approach. And if you don't fit into that, you need to find a new home. You know, you need to free their future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. The the data needs to inform the decision, but you need your gut, et cetera, to, to, to make the full decision. Jacinta, thank you for joining us from the Starship Enterprise. (laughs) (laughs) Did you have a question for uh, Nick? Well, it it was the um it was along the lines of actually measuring performance as well. So you touched upon Nick, um, obviously cultural fit, and yes, I've moved on people that just don't fit in the organisation. What other metrics are you using to measure that actual performance? There, I mean, you know, like the traditional used to be just you know hours times billing, you know, less, less uh, sort of like a rounded amount for, um, you know, unbillable time and that sort of thing. But I think it's, if you're going to be best at this, we probably need a little bit more rounded suite of performance metrics. Yeah. So uh, it's a great question. It's probably one we could talk about for hours. I think the key thing is, is what is a successful day, week, month, year for that role? Now, if we can answer that where they can come to work and say, I had a successful day or I had a successful week or I've had a successful month, it's normally the same metric. So it may be for some businesses that are still time-based, it may be output. So it may be that they have to bill three times their salary, which equals you know $24,000 a month. So to do that, they need to be working at X productivity based on the number of workable hours they have. And this is the key part where a lot of people don't work out the workable hours. You've got to take out training. You've got to take out internal meetings. You've got to take out holidays. How many real workable hours does an accountant actually have? It's around that 15 to 1600 hours, but a lot of people think it's more like 1920, but that's the amount of hours outside of holidays. So then you go, all right, well, what's success? So depending on their role, like an admin role will have a, a different definition of success and they need to be hard and soft so with all of ours we have um, clear key metrics so what are the hard numbers that they need to achieve then we also have a soft metric which is do they contribute to the culture and the values do they live our values and that's actually goes 10 percent of their performance review then we talk about their learning what self-learning did they did so they have a learning plan did they complete it what what other things do they do above and beyond that? And that has another 10%. And then we have a 10%, which is a manager discretion. You know, were they living and breathing? You know, are they an A player basically that we want to keep? So a lot of our performance metrics is, yes, some of it is output, which it has to be in the industry that we're in. But then some of it is those soft ones. But the key message is, and, and this is the key thing, your team want to know what success is on a daily, and weekly, monthly basis. And if they can't answer, if I was to ring your team and say, what does success look like for you today so that you can go home knowing that you've fulfilled and done your role to the best ability and you had success? Most businesses can't answer that. Hmm. Very much so. I, that's, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, I like that. And then how does that success link to the success of the business and the purpose of the business? It all flows up. But, you know, starting at that level is a great way because your team want to know whether they're 
doing a great job. What people hate is when it comes to a performance review, which a lot of firms only do once a year, and they think they're doing amazing. But then you turn around and go, well, I was expecting a higher productivity. I was expecting more billables and I was expecting X, Y, and Z. And they're like, well, I never knew that. So your expectation of what I wanted versus what you think are very different. We're not aligned, but because you're the employer, I just have to suck it up and accept it. So them, I call it no surprises. There should be no surprises. If they know what success is, you know what success is. If they're not being successful, you can have a regular conversation around that because it's clear to them and you. And to be honest, if they're not being successful, most of the time they self-select and leave before you have to push them. Mm. Yeah, they do. I agree. Yeah. It's probably a little bit too granular, but do you perceive that that success metrics that you kind of mentioned there um, would be built into the process systems and processes that they're adhering to that so that, that when they're doing something they have a clear idea of what time they're supposed to be achieving and what success looks for for each of the activities etc that they're doing it definitely does help i mean most businesses don't have clear position descriptions and what i mean by clear position descriptions is that if you if you're an accountant you might be you should have level one to say level five so a level one will only do a certain level of work, a level two, three, four. Typically what we have is everyone does everything, which is fine. But then if someone's taking longer to do a more complex job, it may be because they're not confident yet in, in doing that complex role. But what typically happens is that just gets found out everyone and anyone, and that doesn't take, take into account. And then what the managers get heat from the partners on is they turn around and go, John, Joe's not you know, performing, he took five hours more than he should have on that job. It's, well, Joe should probably never have got that job. Mm. But because we're so frantic and behind and we don't manage the workflow, but yes, it definitely comes back to systems. It comes back to going, all right, well, within our systems, what level of person should be doing that work? Because a an accountant shouldn't do the job from A to Z. They should only do elements of it. Admin should do, be doing parts of it. You know, junior should be doing parts of it. There's parts where the senior needs to do it. It's not someone from A to Z. Now, if you're still working on that workflow methodology, then that's the part that needs to change because it's a lot easier when it's very clear what tasks and duties someone has to do, what learning they need to do to get to that level to move up to the next, the higher comp or more complex work. And I think when we link that to a learning plan, you more senior people need to be learning human skills because their role is about empowering and about getting the best output from the people underneath them. That's success. But a lot of them are trained that I need to build 90% of my time, which equals this much per month. And when you're a senior accountant and a manager, that's not your job. Your job is your team to be doing that. It's for you to be leading, reviewing, training, developing. But yet a lot of firms, and we had that with one of our new clients, they had an expectation that their point of contact would train six people with us overseas and still bill 80% of the time. And I said to the partners, I'm like, you're unrealistic her role success for her role now is that team not her billables mm. but it does link to process it definitely makes it easier yeah absolutely do you have any other questions there Jacinta well oh this is the same as I could talk about this forever I mean um, developing developing people and um, you know this pipeline of talent and everything is something that I'm really into um, myself because, well, ultimately one day I'd like to sell my business and they'd, I'd like to, for there to be talented people um, floating around in the market to buy my business. So that's that's my very selfish um, thing. But I feel as though as business owners, we, we need to invest more in developing our people. One of the things I guess that I've been trying to develop for myself and I, I'll do a little burst on it and then give up the will to live because it's hard. Um, is developing sort of like a workbook for graduates or people coming into the into the firm where, you know, you've just got bullet points of skills, whether they be soft skills and hard skills and everything. Because, and it's even something that even, you know, because I'm looking at small firms and, and I had this discussion on Facebook this morning. It's really hard to develop these people because you you got this brand new little intern or work experience kid or something and think, hell, what am I going to do with this person now? Because you've we've got no formalized pathway to give them that um, training through our 
our um, thing. And so that this person then ends up filing for a week um, and then you don't see them again. If it's, if it's a work experience kid or an intern, that's all they do. So I, I guess small firms need help in developing plans to develop their people. And, and this, this little graduate or, you know, staff training workbook, just so you could actually say, ah, oh, I see you don't know how to do a bank reconciliation. Well, best we cover that off. Otherwise, you can get a third-year accountant and all of a sudden you realise, ah, oh, we've never done a bank reconciliation before. Yeah, and years of experience and title don't, are not equivalent to what they can do and output. And mm. I think that that's what you're talking about is exactly what we've developed for our internal team members. And it's something that our um, head of accounting training, et cetera, that's all that's their world all they do is build training programs for all different layers so the first step is is having a very clear organization chart or people strategy so what are the hat or what are the levels of roles that you need because if you've only got senior people in your business it means your senior people are doing junior level work Mm -hmm. if you've only got junior level people which could be offshore then you don't have anyone senior doing the reviewing and the training developing and the client communication so it's very you need to have a very clear people strategy. What are all the levels that you you need to have? Now, if I was to go into a business to buy and had two senior people and one junior, that's a massive risk to me. Like for me wanting to buy that, I'd be like, if one or two of those seniors go, the business goes because the owner's already gone. But if I went into a business that had an entry-level person, I mean, they're normally termed a graduate we call them entry level roles then a level one person level two level three you know level four is like a senior and a client manager and then you had the partner if you had that structure in place where the process is not reliant on a person the relationship with a client is not reliant on one person it's spread across the business that's a business that is not key person dependent so it's really around having a people strategy that has all the different levels and we go through this with new clients when they come on we go all right well, show us your org structure and we're like your top end heavy and your bottom end heavy and you don't have anyone in the middle. So that's why you don't have any seniors because you're not developing the people that should be at a level two or level three into that senior level. Mm. And you got too many graduates and too many juniors. So yes, you can get lots of work done, but who's going to review it? Who's going to, you know, mentor and manage them. So having a very clear people plan or org chart of what it needs to look like over the next three years. And you should have people at all different levels. You can't just have them all as seniors. You can't have them all as juniors. So it's having that clear plan. And then it's, to be honest, it's quite easy then to link a training plan to each one of those because then you go, all right, entry-level people, this is the skills that they need to have. Now, if they've done a certificate or a diploma or a degree, they should have the theory. We need to teach them the practical. But then to go to the next level, then they're going to need some specific training and it could be uh, super fund accreditation. It could be, you know, FBT training or tax training or GST. So then you can basically bucket the training that you want people to go through. And then you've got on the other side of it, your business process and systems, which is the, how you want your team members to do it your way. But then there's the technical part for each level. And then understanding your people is probably the key because you can't just have a one way development plan you can't just say look this is the development plan you get because your team member that's currently an entry level they may not want to be a manager they may be wanting to just be an intermediate accountant because they're a great technician and they're not great at communicating some of my when i'm my accounting firm i would never put some of my senior people in front of a client because i don't understand them (laughs) How, how how is a client meant to but we promote people because of tenure into roles where they're not capable and skilled. We set them up to fail. So someone may not want to be client facing. Great, but we need an expert technician that's an absolute weapon. They're so critical to us and that's the role that they will stay in. We just need to pay them really well to do that Hmm. and never want them to leave and, and for them to never want to look. So not everyone will go through the pyramid of growth. Some people will stop at this level and some people want to stop at that level. Like I had someone last week that we interviewed and they said, I'm a mum with kids. What's important to me first is family and I will do everything that I can do, but these are the hours that you can have me. So I don't want to be an executive with a global responsibility because that's not what my priority is. My family is, I don't want to travel. I don't want to do that. So when you're looking at 
what that person wants and needs for their life. You can then marry it up to what you need in the business and go, cool, Mary, she fits this box. You know, Michael, he fits that box. Michael doesn't want to stay in a junior role. He wants to be a senior within two and a half years. How do we help him to get there? So it's understanding your people's development of where they want to go as much as what do you need in the business and what timeframes do you need them to get to those levels? Yeah, that's, that's along the same lines as I'd like to magically have appear in front of me. I might be able to help you with that in a couple of months. My team are working on it. So <laughs> I'll, I'll give you an update in a couple of months of where they're at with that. Thank you. I sometimes wonder whether for smaller firms, whether they almost need to think about having a collective employee who, who sort of moves around them to gain those skills to ensure that there's enough of the training available to them. Like you said, that's the um, intern arrived and just spent a week um, filing rather than sort of moving around potentially. And I completely get that, that, you know, in a smaller firm, this is what we're doing and this is, we need to do this now, etc. You but, do have to remember though, sorry to cut in there, you do have to no. remember, you know, if that's what your proposition is. And I know that we need people to do those. And look, we've got, you know, in our offices, we've got cleaners, we've got, you know, all sorts of levels of roles. People have got to be passionate about that, particularly if you talk about millennials. They're not going to want to come in and make coffee and file. Like they won't stick around, but there are people that love that. So when you're looking at what the role is, it's, it's really recruiting the right person for that role um, because some people do love that. I, I certainly don't, but some people do. And others need to just be explained to say, you know what, for the next six months, you're going to have to suck it up a little bit and do some stuff that you're probably not going to enjoy doing. Because I don't enjoy doing it, but you need to do it as part of your development. And if you have that conversation, as opposed to just giving them the work and then they do it and they're like, this sucks. Mm. And then they're straight on a job board looking for another job because there's 300 advertisers this month in the accounting in Australia. So it's just being open with them about it. So are you suggesting that like those those tasks that no one likes doing, is that sort of like the basically so they can learn, learn those skills to build onto them going forward? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, and there's a lot of talk about offshoring taking away skills in Australia. Now, the reality is, is that you still need your graduates in your entry-level roles and they need to still learn how to do the basic accounting work that we all used to have to do. But the reality is, is they don't have to do it for two years like we did. They may do it for six months or three months. Mm. So they're fast-tracked through that. So I always say that you can't have someone come in and then just go to a senior. Like, that's just not realistic. They need to understand what they're doing but they're not going to have to take seven years to become a manager anymore. That's done in half the time. So it's about how do you group that skill set that they need and just have them learn and grow and do that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you um, so much for that. Um, jump in again, Jacinta, if you've got any more questions there. And if anyone else listening in, um, um, would like to jump in and ask Nick a question while we have him here, feel free to do so. Um, Kerry's popped into the chat area that, uh, thank you. She doesn't have, a, um, have employees, but she's learned a lot from the session today. Um, if there are any other questions, please jump in. But I will ask you, Nick, are traditional workplace perks still valid? And have you seen new ones emerge during the pandemic that you think will stay with us? Sorry, can you say that again? Have, have traditional workplace perks, are they still valid? The traditional car park, the traditional nice chair, the traditional drinks in the Friday afternoon, are they still valid or have you seen new ones emerge during um, the pandemic? I think they have more, to be honest. I mean, I think, and what I mean by that is that everyone you know, trash talks, you know, you don't need pool tables and you don't need this and you don't need that. And I was chatting to a mate of mine, Mike McHenry from Seamless SMSF a couple of weeks ago. They've got a golf simulator in their office and everyone's like, everyone bags it because they don't have it. What you need is a really, really good environment for your team. Now, what that environment looks like and what toys and tools that has in there for them to have some downtime and for you to go, go and have your lunch break. Most offices I go to doesn't have a lunchroom, which says to me, you don't want your team to have a break. You want them to work and eat at their desk. They shouldn't do that. Create an environment and a place where they can go and have some downtime, refresh their brain. 
they'll be mentally better. So I think that the perks are definitely, they're probably more important now, particularly when you do have remote work from home people. So they need the right equipment. They need to have boundaries of when they're at work and when they're not at work. So your technology now needs to shut them out and lock them out at certain times. So when they're working in the office, you can shut them out by going, go home. Physically, you need to leave. I'm asking you politely, go home, be with your family. This work will be here tomorrow. So with the remote part, you need to make sure that they have, you know, the same quality desk. Like I'm using a stand-up desk now. I'm use, I have a comfortable chair. I have the dual screen set up. I have that at my home as well. So you need to make sure that particularly when we work from home, that you have all these perks and things that you send them. Like if they're not in an office environment, that you send them a gift to wow them every now and again without them expecting it. So I think it's actually, it's probably harder now that they work from home because when I use Easter, for example, at the office, I was the Easter bunny. I walked around, gave everyone a chocolate and thanked them for their work for the last three months. If they're not like the ones that were remote, we had to send them a gift. I had to, you know, message them. I had to, you know, it was harder, but you have to make that effort. So I think it's definitely needed more now. But if your team member are used to coming into the office and going to the gym down the road, then you need to look at, well, how do I help them get a membership at, near their home now? So I think that is definitely important. It's key. Um, and a lot of people just see work from home cost saving. But if you're saving that cost, which is roughly 30% on cost of an employee. So if you're paying someone 100, it's generally about 30 grand of on cost for office, car parks and all that. You need to still invest that with them. It's not a saving. You need to spend it by getting the team together once a year and, and flying them all to the same place. Accommodation in a nice place, team building. So work from home is not about a cost saving. It's about a reallocation of money. That's all it is. But a lot of people like, I'll save by having a work from home environment. No, no, no. You need to invest the 30% because you need to work harder. You need to post stuff to your team members. All these little things that you do in the office, like drinks on a Friday Arvo. How do you still do that by you know, yes, you can do like a lunch and learn like this, but you need to physically provide them with the lunch. If you're the employer, like if Heather, if we're all Heather's team, she should send us lunch. Now, I'm not saying that you should be every week, Heather, because we're not your team members. But if we, if this, if this was a work call, mm. you know, you should be sending them lunch and then going, let's have a lunch and learn. It's not just, you know, go and make a sandwich and let's sit down. So I think that's where the expectations of, I suppose it's what people are delivering versus what they should be doing is very different. Yeah. Nick's sending everyone a vegan sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> Probably wouldn't want mine. Send you a little a toaster to taste it. <laughs> Thank you for that, Nick. Now we have had a question come through from Katrina, which is, Nick, what are your thoughts on bringing into play a loyalty bonus? So we have what we call a tenure recognition program, which is exactly that. So they have rewards for tenure. So the rewards are based on six months, one year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and it goes all the way up. And our team members all know exactly what that tenure recognition benefit is. Some of it's soft, some of it is hard, hard meaning cash. Some of it is soft skills being merchandise or different bits and pieces. So to be honest, it's critical. We only put this in place in the last 18 months and, and I often wonder why we didn't do it earlier but we just never got around to it. But it's so important that you do recognise and reward. And this is not nothing to do with their salaries. This is above and beyond, regardless of their performance. If they, get a, if they go from a level two to a level three, which gets a 20% rise, that still happens. Plus they get the recognition of the tenure recognition program. So I think it's, it's critical to reward people, to thank them for that loyalty. If you look at the average age of people working workplaces now, it is less, um, but equally, really good cultures and really good workplaces have really long tenure. I'll use a supplier in the industry, BGL. Now, I don't want to talk about their product. I'm talking about the culture that they have. You look at Daniel, the COO, he's been there for like 25 years. You look at most of their leadership team have been there for like 15 years. There's very few people in that workplace that have been there less than eight years. Now, what do they do to, to keep people? And I think that's the, the question I really love. And I love talking to Ron and Daniel about what, is it that you do because you're building a culture where people want to be part of it. Now it hasn't always been smooth sailing for them. They've had tough times with technology and being behind the market needing to catch up, but people still stayed there. So I think the tenure recognition, rewarding them and recognizing them more importantly for their loyalty and thanking them 
is so important. Hard and soft is the key way to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for sharing that, Nick. Um, does anyone um, else have any more questions? We're coming towards the end of the session today. We've really learned a lot from Nick and uh, um, Ken has highlighted, oh, Ken is actually in Utah. He's not in Texas. That's what was, <laughs> That's why Sunny in his convertible. Loved it. I love, oh, Utah is a amazing snow day. <laughs> um, and he said um, that he shared that it was a good point, reinvest savings in the employees that work at home. So, uh, yeah, which is a good point. And uh, um, um, thank you, Ken, for throwing that in the chat area. If, if no one has any um any further questions? I'll, I'll throw to you, Nick. Is there anything final that you would like to leave us with? I think it, you always need to remember that the two most important parts of our business are our people and our customers. And you need to provide a wow experience to both of them. It's not just your customers, it's your people that look after your customers. But equally, if you don't focus on your customers, then you won't have any people. So I think it's, you know, really put focus into people. I see so much so many businesses focus on the customer and the, the way that they deliver, but they forget the people that are serving them. So grow and invest in your people and your people will grow your business for you. So don't forget to invest in them, whether that be in training or whether that be in, in strategy, whatever it is, is develop your humans because we are in a human business. Our industry is going to get a lot more automated, but we will always be needed because of the human element. So remember to develop your people so that they are the best people and that they can serve your clients in the way that they should be served. Absolutely, absolutely. How can people get in contact with you, um, Nick? Uh, you can email me at nick at toaglobal.com or you can find me across all social media partner, um, channels. Nick Sinclair is if you find, you should be able to find me. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today, Nick, and, and sharing all of your insights with us. Everyone has uh, really enjoyed the session. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for the opportunity, Heather. And